probably darkening the minds of all of us with some apprehension, some anxiety, some fear. That is the rapid and alarming spread of the coronavirus. And I'll start with an anecdote. I was in Canada last year. And after a talk, a six-year-old boy came to me. And he asked me, why do bad things happen to good people? Now, generally, even if somebody asks this question at a personal level, if I have the time, I, I try to make sense of where they are coming from. So then I asked him, what happened? He said, today morning I was taking my milk and my biscuit, and my biscuit fell into the milk. <laughs> <laughs> so for him, at that level, that was the bad thing that happened. I lost my biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> so we all get this question when something unexpected, something undesirable, something uh, uh, terrible starts happening to us and depending on our situation, now what is a bad thing can vary for each one of us. But this is an existential perplexity for humanity for as long as humanity has existed. That things seem to go wrong. And when things go wrong, uh, if we have a broad understanding uh, of God's existence and we have some faith in God, then how do we see God's role, God's grace, God's hand amid the difficulties that we are facing? So I'll talk this in three broad parts. But the basic theme will be this, that right? if you want to see compassion, see God's grace, see his compassion, uh, bad things will happen in life. And we can't always be grateful for all situations. But we can be grateful in all situations. For all situations means the specific thing that has happened, sometimes terrible things happen. And it's almost impossible to be grateful for that terrible situation in itself. But even in that situation, we can be grateful. And how is that? That will be the main theme of this class. I'll use an acronym called ACE. So ACE your life with gratitude. So how can we look beyond the situation in three ways? Look around the situation, look, something bad has happened, look for the good around the bad. Then C is look for the good to counter the bad. And then thirdly, look for the good that may emerge from the bad. So when bad things happen, they just happened. And whatever reasoning we may give, but it's already there. So, and it's bad, no amount of philosophical or logical or any kind of reasoning is going to very easily change that bad, that bad thing's vision for us. So what we need to do is, 
expand our vision. So look for the good beyond the bad or around the bad. Now, of course, we could look at a broader level and we can say that as we live in a world that is technologically advanced and so at least there is awareness, there is spreading of measures of what are precautions to be taken. So I will talk about this primarily from a philosophical and then philosophical practical perspective and we will try to sense, make sense of contemporary events also. So at a material level also, the awareness and the preparedness that, that we are capable of doing, that is something we can be grateful for. And the Black Plague hit Europe. At that time, people didn't even know for a long time what hit them. In fact, initially, researchers, now we could use the word scientists, but actually the word scientist started, came in the 19th century. Newton never referred to himself as a scientist. The word at that time was a natural philosopher. So, so whatever was equivalent of scientists, when the Black Plague hit Europe, they tried to find out what was the cause. And they noticed initially that wherever there are cats, there's a black plague. <laughs> so in several towns and in several cities and several countries in, America, in Europe, they started killing all the cats. And when they killed the cats, they found that the black plague increased. <laughs> so it has been caused not by cats, but it has been caused by rats. rats. <laughs> so what happens is now rats and cats more or less coexist. So they there is causing in 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 logic there are there's causation and there is correlation. Causation means A is there, B is there. So A causes B, that's causation. But correlation A is there and B is there. But that doesn't necessarily mean that A caused B. It's like researchers have found that people with bigger hands have better vocabularies. <laughs> hey, really? Bigger hand? What has bigger hand got to do with better vocabularies? Actually, people who have bigger hands are older. <laughs> so naturally they know more than people who have people who have small hands and small children. <laughs> so bigger hands and big, better vocabulary, that is a correlation. That's not a causation. So in the past, we have been when we had disasters hit us, often we're just groping in ignorance, trying to find out what was the cause. So at a material level we can be grateful, at least. We know what we need to do to some extent, awareness and preparedness. Now let's try to look at it from a spiritual perspective. So this is a continuation of the same point. Knowledge to make sense of what is happening. So what is this disease that has come? We have some knowledge at the level of science, at the level of medicine, in terms of preparedness. To, but we will also look at it from a spiritual perspective or from a philosophical perspective. That when something happens in the world, now what is its cause? So broadly, when things happen the way they do, there are three levels of causation, or three broad causes you see. There is God's will, there is free will, and then there is evil. So what do we mean by these three things? Now everything that happens is not necessarily God's will. There is, there is, so suppose we do some, we do some foolish mistake. Now, was that God will that we do that mistake? No, it was our forgetfulness or foolishness. Similarly, some, some bad people, some wicked people do terrible things. Now, is that God wanting them to do those things? No. So, there's a difference between God's will and God's sanction. Will refers to his intention. This is what he wants. Sanction refers to what he allows. What he wa wants and what he allows. So because God has given each one of us free will, so sometimes we may use our free will wrongly. And to some extent, God may allow that free will for us to use it wrongly for some time. So then... There is God's will is one of the causes, but it's only one of the causes. It's not the 
soul cause. So when bad things happen, it may well be because some people have acted foolishly. Or somebody say drives drunk and then they hit someone and that person gets seriously injured. That's not God's will. That's the, that person's misuse of free will. Now there is free will and it's misuse. But there is something worse than that. Evil is not just uh, occasional or incidental misuse of free will. It is when somebody keeps doing something wrong again and again and again and again, then they become dead into it. So whenever we do something bad, we feel bad after doing that bad thing. But if somebody doesn't feel bad after doing bad, then they are terribly bad. It's a simple level, say, if you're walking in a crowded ro or room and we step on someone's foot. As soon as we notice, we move our foot back and say, I'm sorry, sorry. But suppose somebody steps on someone else's foot and they notice it and they deliberately raise their foot and bang it down. <laughs> hey, that's terrible. So that's evil. So now, so that means, say, going back to the car driving example, suppose somebody deliberately wants to run over somebody. And it's not that they're drunk and they're driving, they're deliberately catching someone, pointing at someone and run their car over that person. That is evil. So when something happens in this world, there could be God's will, there is free will, and there is evil. Now within evil, there are broadly two categories. There is moral evil, and there is natural evil. Moral evil, for example, Hitler called the Holocaust. There was, you know, he, he incited a whole nation to hate Jews and Gypsies, and Estimates vary, about 6 million to 11 million people were killed. But it's moral evil. People did terrible things. And then there is natural evil. Natural evil means nature leads to certain events by which some bad things happen. So, for example, tsunami we could say. Now, if you consider the coronavirus, where would it fall? Natural. Natural evil. So, whenever some things happen in life, there is God's will, there is free will, and there is evil. So now when we talk about natural, natural evil, what does it mean? That you could say there is a difference between, another way to term it, there is a difference between evil and tragedy. Say like, suppose there is a flood and the water overflows, and people suffer, people, there is a lot of loss of life and property because of that. That's natural evil. That's a tragedy. But, suppose somebody deliberately opens the door of the dam and causes the water to flood. And that's moral evil. So now, Gahana Karmana Ugati, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, how karma works is very difficult to understand. So now, among these things, if we consider the God's will, free will, and evil, and in within evil, there is natural evil and moral evil. Now what is in our control is that it's a free will. It's our free will, we try to use it as well as we can. And we try to find, try to avoid moral evil. So now, now some people say that in Wuhan when this uh, virus originated, the Chinese government initially was more concerned with maintaining its reputation than maintaining the protect, than taking, ensuring the protection of people. And that's why, for almost a month or two, they didn't take any action adequately. And then suddenly, they even took action against those who were doctors who were trying to alert it. And then suddenly, when they realized how bad it has gone, they shut down the whole city. In fact, uh, five million people. They shut down. It's the five million people. I mean, it's, it's unprecedented the history of humanity as far as we know it. So many people being shut down at one time. It's you consider from a perspective of America, the four biggest cities in America: New York, LA, San Francisco, Chicago. All four of them combined together is less than the population of what was shut down, the area that was shut down. A complete blockage. 
So now what happens is that natural evil will come on its own course. But so the, the we all may have different people may have different philosophical opinions. I believe this philosophy. I don't believe this philosophy. But one thing that we can all agree. I will say two things that we can agree. One is that life is tough. Whatever happens, life is tough. Even for people who feel life is easy, well, we can say that they have not seen life much. You see, it's sooner or later, life, there are difficulties in life. So, life is tough. This is a given truth. And second is that our responses to life can make life tougher. There can be terrible situations in our life, but no situation is so terrible that it takes away our power to make it worse. <laughs> now, because that means natural evil may come of its own accord. But if there is moral evil, or if there is misuse of free will, then that can make things worse. So when we are trying to look at how do we see God's hand in whatever is happening, we will look at in terms of, as I said, to make sense of what's happening and to find our role within that. So that at least whatever suffering has come, we don't make it worse. And as much as possible, we try to minimize it. So, during the talk, if any, if any point is not clear, feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. And of course, at the end of the session, we will have separate time for questions. So now I will look at this from another perspective. So this is basically why things happen the way we, they do. So now I, I told moral evil is people doing bad things. Natural evil is nature bringing tragedies upon us, nature bringing calamities upon us. So now, why would nature do such a thing? Now for that, we need to look at the principle of karma. So here is another perspective now. When, when suffering comes upon us, what is its cause? That cause could be at three levels. There is an immediate cause, there is a remote cause, and there is the ultimate cause. So the immediate cause in this case is the virus, suppose somebody gets sick, then the virus coming into their body is the immediate cause of their sickness. Now beyond that, there is a remote cause. Whenever any situation happens, everybody is not afflicted or affected equally. Some people may, now all the people who will be affected by the coronavirus, according to some people, they're saying between 40 to 60 percent of the world's population may get affected if it just spreads like this. But they're saying that most people will recover. They have to be in isolation for some time. But it's only people who are having very low immunity or they have already some respiratory tract issues. They may find it or they may find it difficult to deal with it. So now the same stimulus affects different people differently. And why is that? That is where past karma comes into the picture. The immediate cause is a valid explanation. It is a correct explanation. It is not, however, the complete explanation. In the same house, suppose, say some one person gets malaria. Now, for mosquitoes, all bodies are just sources of blood. The mosquito does not discriminate. I'm going to eat this, bite this person, not bite that person. You know, so, <laughs> But now one person, is it that the mosquito bit only one person, didn't bit the other, bite the other person? Is it that the mosquito bit one person and bit the other person also, but the other person didn't get infected? Now you might say that, okay, you had, this person had low immunity. That's why they didn't, get, they didn't get the disease. But if you look at medical history, you quite often find that sometimes people who have low immunity, they don't get infected. I know one friend, he got malaria and his doctor told him your condition is very serious. And he said, if you don't treat this, uh, you, you may even die. Because he had other health complications also. But then what happened was, 
this friend is still alive and his doctor died of malaria. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens is, the immediate cause is a, is a correct cause, but it's not the complete cause. So in a house there are five members, why does one person only get malaria and others don't get malaria? <laughs> there is a past karma involved also. So there is present and past. And then uh, there is the ultimate cause. Why are we at all in this world, which is a tough place, where we are prone to distress? That is because of our disconnection from God. That is, we are disconnected from Krishna. And that's why we are in the material existence, where there is distress. So, Janma Mrityu Jara Vyadhi Dukkha Daushan Darshanam. In 12.9 in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, in this material world itself, we are all prone to old age, disease, death and rebirth. So now, we are, the point, what is the main acronym we are discussing? Does anyone remember? Yes. Ace. Yes. So we are looking for the A part. Look for the good around the bad. So what is the uh, good around the bad? We have some knowledge to make sense of life and what happens in life. That's what we are trying to understand. Now I'll come to this part a little later of how to counter it. But so, the next point here is that so why does something happen at a particular time? So the the present, the way why now things unfold, the reactions we get are an unpredictable combination of our past and present actions. Some people, they say suppose by their past, by their past karma they have a sickly body. And then they have to be ultra careful about their diet. If a little imbalance, the food is a little spicy or a little oily, then they, they get, their whole health gets disrupted by it. Some people, they have a very healthy body. They seem to treat their tongue like a conveyor belt. <laughs> <laughs> Anything and everything goes on their tongue and still they seem, they seem healthy, they seem slim and life just goes on for them. So what has happened is the immediate cause is there that they may be eating inappropriately but what happens to a particular person is an unpredictable combination of the immediate cause and the remote cause. So that's why at a particular stage in our life why something happens specifically that is difficult to understand. That's why I said we can look for the good around the bad. We can make sense of life in general and the events that happen within life. But we may not be able to pinpoint one particular cause for why something happens. So now if you move on, now we look at to counter. Look for, now to count, when we are we want to counter something. We have to look at what we have, not at what we don't have. In the Ramayana, when the Vanaras had to fight against the Rakshasas, the Rakshasas, they were in home territory and they had sophisticated, they had weapons. They had maces and cudgels and their bows and arrows and swords, swords. The monkeys, they didn't have any such weapons. They just, they just pick up rocks, they would uproot trees, and they would just fight with their own bare fists. But if they had focused only on, oh, they have weapons, we don't have anything, then they would have lost the morale to fight. So we all, at each time, there is some things we don't have, there is something which we have. We have to focus on what we have. Our mind will keep looking at, oh, this is not right, that is not right, that is not right. The mind may say, oh, there's no vaccine for this. Well, okay, but we can prevent it. And it is not intrinsically a fatal disease. If you look at the history of the world, there have been many terrible diseases. And some of them have been far more lethal, fast acting than the present disease. So now, what do we have? Again, at a material level, I talk about, uh, we, we have certain resources. We at least have some uh, preventive knowledge. We have some knowledge at least we have. But now let's look at a spiritual level. What is it that we have to be able to counter this? So three things. 
look within, look up and look ahead. So with spiritual knowledge, we can guide our vision. So Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that we should function with Jnana Chakshu. Utkramantam sitam vapi bhunjanam vagunanvitam vimudha nanu pashyanti pashyanti jnana chakshu shaha This is pashyanti jnana chakshu shaha In 1510 in the Bhagavad Gita he says that learn to see reality with the eyes of knowledge. So spiritual, spiritual knowledge is meant to equip us that we can look at things with a more informed view. In fact, if our spirituality does not inform and, and transform our vision of reality, then that spirituality is not of much use for us. It is just one more set of theoretical knowledge. And actually speaking, we don't see just with our eyes. We see with the knowledge that enables us to make sense of what we see with our eyes. Suppose somebody lives in a remote tribal kind of community and they have no knowledge of modern economics and they come to a stock exchange. And there are hundreds of people sitting in the stock exchange. They are looking at a giant screen and there they see the stock exchange index crash down. They see the exchange, the line go down and they are, oh no, they catch their head. And this tribal says, what happened? Just one line went down on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so, now everybody sees the same thing. But we don't see with our eyes alone. We see with the intelligence that helps us make sense of what our eyes are seeing. So, Jnana Chakshu is required at one level each area of life. So, our knowledge inspire, enables us to see things better. Same way, what does spirituality help us do? So, look within. Look within means, beyond our virus-prone bodies, we are virus-proof souls. We are at our core indestructible. We, our bodies may be vulnerable, our minds may be agitable. But the soul is indestructible. And this understanding that at our core, we are indestructible, we are safe, that can itself calm us down. Actually for all of us, whenever we face any difficulty, it is that the difficulty is out there, but the more the difficulty seems to threaten us, the more we get agitated by it. Say a simple example. Suppose we are, stand, we are standing on a road and somebody comes and pushes us. Or they walk by and they push us and get a little shaken. And we may be annoyed, we may glare at them, we may yell at them, but that's it. But suppose we are standing somewhere and the earth under us starts quaking. That will alarm us much more. Why? Because that seems a much bigger threat for us. So similarly, if we identify ourselves with the body, then anything that seems to damage and destroy the body that seems to be like a threat to our very existence. It seems like the ground under us is quaking. But when we understand that I am a soul, then Yes, it's matter if somebody is pushing me over. I have to balance myself. I have to check what I can do to not fall down. But it's not that big a threat. So, first when we understand that we are spiritual beings, we look within. Look within with Jnana Chakshu. With the eyes of knowledge, you understand I am the Atma. I am. The body is virus prone, but the soul is virus proof. So, in many, on many, many, many occasions, Whenever there is, in a, there is a problem, there is some danger, there is some threat, there is panic. In crowded places, for example, say if in a movie theatre or a sports stadium, some fire occurs. And the fire may not cause as much damage as 
the panic running of people which causes a stampede and kills people. So, often our reaction to a problem eh, makes the problem worse. Or our reaction to a problem is a bigger problem than the problem itself. So by looking within and understanding I am a spiritual being, we can ensure that we don't panic. We don't let ourselves become overwhelmed by fear. There are different kinds of phobias. Some people have hydrophobia. What is hydrophobia? Water. Hydrophobia, yeah. <laughs> some people have arachnophobia. You know what is that? Spiders. Spiders. So some people are, have germophobia. 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 They are constantly fearful. If somebody 10 feet away from them coughs, they will run away from them. <laughs> it's, they're paranoid. So of course, phobia is sometimes a medical condition, but our the fear, the irrational fear can make things much worse. So now look within. That can calm, down, calm us down. Then look up. Look, look up means that just because things are out of our control, does it mean that they are out of control? There is everything is within God's plan. Everything is not necessarily God's plan, but it is within God's plan. Within God's plan means that God can accommodate whatever happens. Just like in a school, the school's purpose is that the students study well, pass their exams and get promoted to the next level till they eventually graduate. But if a student fails, the student doesn't study and flunks, the school has a plan to accommodate them. Okay, if it's one or two subjects, okay, you go to the next class, but you do redo the subjects. If there's many subjects they fail, then you redo this level again. So the students failing is also accommodated within God, within the school's plan. The student's failing is not the school's plan, but it is accommodated within the school's plan. Similarly, the things that happen in the world, that the, everything is within God's plan. Things are not out of control. And the world can hurt us in many ways, but greater than life's power to hurt, hurt us, is God's power to heal us. So when we look up, now when I'm talking about look within and look up, this is not just sentimental or intellectual. Sentimental means, how oh, we think of oh, God is there, you take care of everything. Intellectual means, we philosophically understand the God's existence and we rationally accept that the God's plan. This is important, but it is actually spiritualizing our consciousness. These principles, what we are talking about, they may make sense to us intellectually. And it's good if we try, we try to use our intelligence to understand this. But when we actually practice spiritual processes, say when we practice Bhakti Yoga, when we chant the name of Krishna, when we worship Krishna, when we do, uh, when we try to fix our mind on the Lord, that is when we start experiencing these things. So, now, the, the philosophical knowledge is important as a guide for our practice. It is practice that will give us realization. Philosophical knowledge is like the map. And the practice is like driving along the map. So what we are discussing is when we say look up and look within. These are not just, just, not just intellectual conceptions. They are actually intellectual guides for our spiritual journey. So look up. And then... Beyond that, we say, okay, I may look up, I may look, around, I may look within, look up, but still, there is this problem, I have to deal with it. So what do I do about it? So then, that brings us to the third part, look ahead. Look ahead means that look one step ahead. What is today's problem? Today's problems can be always managed today. But it's only when we pile yesterday's problems and tomorrow's problems on today's problems, that even today's problems become unmanageable today. It's like, say, 
we have to carry a lot of luggage, say to our car, or we are moving, so we have to carry the luggage to a, to a truck. Now, okay, we can carry one suitcase at a time. Uh, but if we have that one suitcase, and we put a second suitcase, and we put a third suitcase, and we put a fourth suitcase, and then we, I can't do this at all. We, we feel powerless. So when we look ahead, we need to understand that you know, the Lord, Krishna has arranged the world in such a way that there is the past, there is the future, and in between there is the present. And all that Krishna expects us to do is deal with the present. So look at one step forward. Faith can be understood in different ways, but one definition of faith is the, is the willingness to take one step forward even when the full path is not clear. Faith means the willingness to take one step forward even when the full path is not clear. This is, this is what I can see. With what I can see, I take this step forward. And the way to do this is by seva bhav, by service attitude. We can function in the world either with a controlling attitude or a service attitude. Controlling attitude means, okay, this is how I want things to happen. Now, if I have a controlling attitude, then I need to see the whole path. This is how I want to take the path. But if we understand that we are all parts of Krishna, our eternal relationship with Him is of love and service. Our eternal identity is of, is of, of serving Him. Mama Ivam Shoji, Valoki. Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. So Krishna says, all living beings are my parts. And we are all meant to serve him lovingly. So then, in whatever situation we are in, how do we look ahead? Krishna, how can I serve you now? How can I serve you now? In this situation, how can I serve you? So when you do this, okay, there is something, some, some mess that I made in the past or others made a mess of my life in the past. In the future, some things might come up. But what can I do right now? How can I serve you right now? If we have that attitude, then we'll find that we can. That we always have it, that capacity to take one step forward and move ahead. Now, going back to the philosophy, we talked about the three levels of causes. So look ahead means I have to do something practical. So what do I do at a practical level? So cure at the level of the immediate cause, we, we talk about immediate, remote and ultimate causes. So we look at how we can, by our small steps, address things at all three levels. At the level of the immediate cause, we understand that we should, at one level, take precautions. At the second one, take precautions. But on another level, even when some researchers say find some medical breakthrough, they have some medical breakthroughs, they find some cures, some vaccines, whatever it is. It is all the breakthroughs that happen in major fields of knowledge, they are actually God's grace. They happen by inspiration. Oh, this is the solution. And that inspiration, how does it come? It comes by God's grace. So, we can pray that a cure be found soon. And when a cure is found, Aham Aushadam, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, that I am the healing herb. It means even the power of medicine to cure is given to that medical, that, that substance by God's grace. So we don't see God's cure natural, necessarily coming in some paranormal or miraculous ways. Even the normal healing potency of things also comes from God. <coughs> I was in a hospital in India. It's a spiritual hospital, so they have a slogan over there. Said, we treat, he cures. <laughs> so, we treat. So, medical science is incredibly sophisticated now. And it's, the sheer amount of study that has been done is extraordinary. At the same time, there are so many medical mysteries. Sometimes, somebody has an ordinary flu, and you give them medicine, and this doesn't work. Sometimes a person has a terrible disease, and they're still living normally as if nothing is wrong with them. 
So there are factors beyond what are ordinarily perceivable for us. They are called as medical oddities or medical miracles or medical mysteries. And there are many like this. So the idea is that when a medicine cures, Balasyane Sharanam Pitra Narsimha, the beautiful prayer in the ninth canto of the Shrimad Bhagavatam, where Prahalad prays that, my dear Lord, the immediate cause is not the complete cause. He says when a medicine is given to cure a person, the medicine is the immediate cause, but the medicine alone doesn't cure. It is you who cure through the medicine. So we can pray that, that a medicine be found and the researchers get the inspiration to find the medicine. Until that time, we do what we can to protect ourselves. So then, cure at the level of remote cause. A remote cause means that there is there is karmic complications involved over here. Okay. <clears throat> if we, now this particular disease originated in the Wuhan market, where flesh was being sold. If we consider today, almost every day more animals are slaughtered then the population of New York and LA combined together. It's that many animals are slaughtered every day. So, it is throughout human history, people have eaten meat. We have canine teeth. And we can eat meat if we want. Biologically speaking, we are omnivorous. But our body our gravitates more towards vegetarianism than non-vegetarianism. But the canine teeth are few. And similarly, throughout history, meat has been a small portion of people's diet. But it's the first time in human history that organized slaughterhouses, where millions and millions of animals are grown solely for the purpose of killing. And not only are they grown, they are sometimes artificially stimulated to grow faster, to have more flesh. So when we inflict pain, there will be reactions for that. So there is individual karma and there is collective karma. Individual karma means we do something wrong and we get the reaction for it. But if you are part of a society where something wrong is being done in an organized way, then there will be consequences for that. So at the, at the level of the remote cause, we all can learn to act more responsibly. And we can create awareness, people, that you know, we are all responsible for our actions. There will be consequences for our actions. And um, last, now here, that brings us to an important point, that there is a difference between a cause and a purpose. Cause is why something happened, from where something has come. Purpose is where that thing is taking us. So now, we may not specifically know the cause of the things that happened to us. But we can know the purpose. The purpose is that we are all souls. This is, we are talking about addressing at the level of the ultimate cause. It's like say, if a, if a woman is pregnant and she is nearing delivery. At that time, the contractions happen and the labor pain starts happening. Now, even the best scientist may not be able to find out why each particular pain comes. The cause of the pain, some, sometimes the pain is a lot, sometimes the pain is a less. So the specific magnitude of the pain, the specific way the pain comes, that cause is not so easy to know. But it has a purpose. The purpose is the child is coming out of the womb. And there will be, through it all, the fresh life, a new life will be there in the world. So for us, similarly, you know, we are all souls and we are caught in the womb of, in, in, like, in a womb of material nature, where we are in ignorance. At one level, I, actually I was, in, I was in Canada, I was staying at a devotee's place and a person was just become a devotee and he had a construction company. His construction company slogan was, our houses, our homes 
are as comfortable as your mother's womb. <laughs> now, now, from a biological perspective, actually the mother's womb is a very comfortable place. It has been designed in such a way that the shocks and the jerks, they are minimized. The amniotic fluid surrounds the embryo. And it is comfortable, but it is from a biological perspective. However, we consider from the perspective of a conscious being, being constricted inside a small cavity, a small bag, it's, uh, it's painful. Probably the nearest experience to that we might get is maybe in the locals of Mumbai. <laughs> when the capacity is 50 and 500 people are squeezed squeezed in. So what happens is, so at one level, this is the present we are in, the present situation we are in, it is, it may be comfortable also. But how long is it going to stay comfortable? So now for the child in the womb, it might be, although it's, it's a constricted place, it's a dark place, but, but it might seem comfortable when the child is coming out of it. It's traumatic. What's happening? And it's because of the trauma when the child comes out, the first thing the child does is cry. In fact, it's so ironic that if the child doesn't cry, the parents start crying. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with our child? <laughs> so, the thing is that, that whatever difficulties come in our life, if we are on a spiritual journey, then those difficulties are meant to help us come out of ignorance. They help us to come to a higher, to evolve to a higher level of knowledge to evolve to a more expanded spiritual consciousness. And if we understand this purpose, then we try to understand the cause as much as we can, at the immediate level deal with it, at the remote level deal with it. But most importantly is, the ultimate cause is that we are disconnected from Krishna and the ultimate purpose of everything that happens is, we reconnect with Him. And if this can inspire us to become more spiritual, we address the ultimate cause that by absorption in Krishna, we get the anchor to weather life's storms. So life will have ups and downs and they just can't be avoided. We are, at a, I mentioned earlier that the world is a tough place. So one metaphor to illustrate the toughness of the world is an ocean. The world is often called as Bhavasagar, the ocean of material existence. And in this ocean, waves will come, some small, some big. Now when the waves come, the small waves we might as well tolerate, the big waves, they can hit us and sweep us away. Now, no matter how strong we may be, it's impossible to stop the waves. It's also impossible to ourselves, by our sheer powers, stop ourselves, protect ourselves from being swept away. But if whatever power we have, we use it to hold on to an anchor. And the anchor is strong. If the anchor is unshakable, then the more we hold on to it, the waves may hit us, the waves may swing us, but they won't hurl us away. So for all of us, Krishna is the anchor. He is the ultimate immovable anchor. And our bhakti, the Bhakti Yoga practice that we do is the means by which we train ourselves to hold on to that anchor. And the more firm our grip has become, the more expert we have become in holding on, become in holding on to that anchor, the less we will be shaken by life storms. Now, compassion has two aspects to it. So we need to be caring, but we also need to be careful. So, what is this really? How is this related to what I was speaking? That you know, when we are at our level, so we have some spiritual knowledge, we have some spiritual resources, we might experience some inner shelter and security by this. We want to share with others. Just as by dealing with the coronavirus. The medical, say the medical staff who is treating somebody with the coronavirus. They have to be caring. 
they have to administer the regular medicine, but at the same time, they have to be also careful. So, if someone is only caring without being careful, then they won't be able to be caring for very long. In fact, after some time, others will have to start caring for them. So similarly, uh, we, while we are practicing bhakti, we have to make sure that we don't get so caught up in worldly things. Oh, this happened over here, that happened over there, that happened over there. That in getting so caught in worldly things, we lose our grip on the anchor. Nowadays, with social media, you know, we can hear about almost everything that is happening everywhere. And somehow, see there are three modes, there is goodness, passion and ignorance, sattva, rajas and tamas. So, now in these three modes, what happens is, if we are in the mode of passion, we want to fight. If we are in the mode of ignorance, what is the other thing? Flight. So the typical fight or flight response. So when we are in the modes of passion and ignorance, as most of us are, what happens is, we always gravitate, our attention often gravitates towards the bad news. Oh, this has happened over here, that has happened over there. Oh, what can I do? What can I do? Our mind wants to run away from it. And that way, we sometimes want to stay in touch with the world. But in trying to stay in touch with the world, we stop being in touch, stop being in touch with ourselves. We lose touch with ourselves. We lose touch with our own spiritual understanding and our connection to supreme spiritual reality. So we may want to be aware, we want to be prepared, we may want to help others. But we can be caring, we also need to be careful. So don't get so caught in anxiety about how to deal with the coronavirus that we neglect our spiritual practices. At a practical level, be careful. And be caring toward others also. But at the same time, make sure that we stay spiritually grounded. And then that brings us to the last part. Emerge. We're talking about acronym emerge. Now I talk about how to counter. And then I'm talking about what will emerge. So you have to understand that we don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. Who is it who holds the future? Krishna. That's Krishna. Vedam samatitani Vartamanani charjuna Bhavishani chabhutani Mahamtu Vedana kashjana Krishna says, I know past, present and future. So, we know who holds the future. If we hold on to him, he will guide us about how to face whatever storms life may send. Out. And at, at one level, if you understand I am a soul, then we understand this world is like a drama. Not drama in the sense of unreality, but drama in the sense of it is one level of reality. And we have roles here, we have responsibilities here, but we exist beyond our roles and responsibilities. And sometimes we might be a part of one scene which is terrible. So it's a multi-scene drama, and suppose in one scene the hero is getting beaten, 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 beaten. And you say, what kind of drama is this? Who's the director? <laughs> the hero is getting beaten. But maybe that is what is setting the sea, so how the hero becomes stronger and eventually becomes victorious. So, we should, we should get caught too much in one sea. Na prahari shet priyam prapya no dvijet prapya cha priyam sthira buddhir asam mudo brahma vid brahma nistitaha Krishna says don't become too elated when good things happen. And don't become too dejected when bad things happen. Rather, stay spiritually connected. Brahma with Brahmani So, we can, we, okay, this is a dark phase that we are going through, but let's see what Krishna has in store. And the present will give rise to a brighter future. Conclude with two reflections. Now, we may have to live with fear, but we don't have to live in fear. Live with fear means, when there is danger, we need to be aware of the danger. And we have to live with it. But live in fear, live with fear means fear 
is a component in our consciousness. That is, live in fear means that fear is the container of our consciousness. We can't think of anything except the danger and the fear caused by it. Now, how does that happen? How can we live with fear instead of in fear? It is when our consciousness expands. If our consciousness is fixated on the source of the fear, then whatever happens, we'll feel. We we'll just will just interpret it in terms of the danger and we we'll stay fearful. But if our consciousness is expanded, then yes, this fear is there, but my life is much bigger. So the ACE acronym is basically meant to help us to expand our consciousness. That yes, there is danger and there is a healthy fear of the danger. But we don't have to live in fear. Okay? The more we practice bhakti, the more we expand our consciousness, then the fears will be in our consciousness, but they won't overtake, they don't dominate our consciousness. And we understand that we are always with Krishna in our heart. And we don't know what kind of karma we have done in the past. We don't know what kind of karma we might do tomorrow also. We might sometimes do something foolish. So, but whatever karma may get us to, Krishna will get us to. Krishna will get us to. Krishna assures the Bhagavad Gita, Machitta Sarva Durgani, Mat prasadat So sarva durgani. Whatever obstacle might come in your life, Krishna says, if you become conscious of me, you will pass over all obstacles by my grace. So Krishna's grace is not in removing the obstacles, but in giving us the resources to raise our consciousness above the obstacles. So where is Krishna's Karuna in today's Karuna? The Karuna is in the resources for us to become conscious of Him. In the various resources that, in, that can help us to become Krishna conscious, thereby this threat doesn't take over our consciousness, but it remains as one part of our consciousness. So if we look at those resources, then we will find that yes, God's grace is still available, God's mercy is still available. And with that mercy, we can face whatever challenge life sends our way. So I'll summarize. I spoke today on this topic of where is Krishna's Karuna amid today's Karuna. So I talked about it in broadly three parts. First, I said that if you have to look at compassion, look at compassion into we can't be grateful for all situations, but we are grateful in all situations. And there's an acronym. What was the acronym? Is. So, what is A? Look for the good around the bad. So, I look for the good around the bad, I said. We have the philosophical knowledge by which you can make sense of life and what is happening in life. So, in that I talked about the principle that whenever something happens, it's not always God wanting it to happen. There are three levels of causes, or three factors involved in anything happening. What are the three things? God's, God's will, free will, free will, and evil. evil. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> then, evil I talked about the two categories. Moral evil and natural. natural. That's excellent. <laughs> thank you. So then, and moral, uh, life is tough, but moral evil can make it much tougher. So, at the very least, what we can do is, we can avoid ourselves indulging in moral evil or we can encourage people or guide people so that they don't do that. And then I talked about how natural evil is basically a reaction to our karma. So then there I talked about three levels of causes. What are three levels of suffering? Immediate cause, remote, remote cause, cause, and immediate cause. cause. So with respect to the current uh, pandemic, what is the immediate cause? The virus. The, virus. the remote cause? Past karma. Past karma. Yes. Not everyone who gets exposed to the virus will get afflicted equally by the virus. So the just immediate cause is correct, it's not complete. And then what is the ultimate cause? Disconnection. Disconnection from Krishna. So then, it's good. Then so I talked about look for so the good around the bad is the knowledge to help us make sense of what is happening. Then what does C? Look for the good, good to counter the bad. And then within that I talked about three 
three three three directions for our vision by which we can get some security amid this uncertainty what are three things look within look within then look up, up. and then look ahead so look within means that beyond our virus prone bodies we are virus proof souls and then look up look up means that everything is within god's plan even when things out of, appear to be out of our control they are not out of control they are under god's control then look ahead means that take one step at a time so as you remember the definition of faith i mentioned the full path is not clear the readiness to take one step forward that is faith and that faith we can have by cultivating service attitude krishna how can i serve you in this situation and then with this when we are going to take one step how can our one steps deal with the problem at the three levels of causation so at the level of the immediate cause we take practical precautions and we understand that when the medicines are provided they are also by god's grace it is god giving the inspiration for researchers to find the medicines at the level of the remote cause we understand that there is collective karma and we are living in a society that is brutal in a where humanity has brutalized the rest of existence so there will be some consequences for that but we at least at an individual level can try to become more responsible in action that we do and at the level of ultimate cause talk about this it uh, anchor yes we hold on to krishna the life storms may come in but if we hold on the storms won't shake us that much and then when i talk about there's a difference between the cause and the purpose as like for the child as well as the mother the labor pains are traumatic but through that something wonderful will come out so the specific which pain comes why that's difficult to understand similarly we are all currently in a state of ignorance and we can evolve to a better situation so rather than fixating on why this particular problem is coming we focus on the purpose that is evolving our consciousness toward krishna and lastly i talk about emerge emerge I talk about how that by krishna's grace you know he can guide us he's always with us that as i said we may have to live with fear we don't have to live in fear by the practice of bhakti our consciousness expands and whatever karma may get us to krishna Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Krishna. Um, Hare Krishna. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Right? Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Prabhu ji. Question. But you see that every year in India, five lakh people are killed. But for that, nothing has been done. So, is there any rationale behind it? <coughs> in what context are you saying five lakh people are killed? Due to a road accident, five lakh people are killed every year in India. Okay. So, for that, we don't slaughter anything. And we are not afraid of driving anymore. Right? We still drive around. Okay. Still, we know that that will happen. So, how okay. do you see that? Okay. Okay. So, get the seat. Thank you. So now, when we talk about, say, there is a mass karma and the animals are being slaughtered, and there will be reactions for that. But see, five lakh people say die in road accidents every every year, and that's in spite of say, although although the animals are not being slaughtered, but still people are being killed. See, one thing is. with respect to karma it's very difficult to understand a one to one correlation no no my question was due to the fire why there's only 5000 people are killed but due to the road accident 5 lakh people are killed in india alone okay. so do we need to be more afraid of driving a vehicle or about the virus so if okay. you okay. put in context okay. there's a huge difference okay okay right but we have a topic here on coronavirus okay. it shows to the topic on coronavirus but not on road accident 
Okay. So what, where is that? Okay, okay, that's a good question, yeah. yeah. So far more people are killed by road accidents than by... Okay. I mean, in India itself, more people are killed than what have been killed all over the world by the coronavirus. Yes. See, death is a fact of life. Mm -hmm. And certain forms of death over a period of time become normalized. See, everybody grows old and dies at one time or the other. Now, for that person, it's traumatic. But for them, yeah, for others, we understand, we go old and we die. So, although death in any form is traumatic, in certain forms of death become normalized. So, at one level, going, going, growing old and dying becomes normalized. Similarly, we drive on roads and road accidents happen. People die because of road accidents. Now, we would be horrified if something like that happens to us or our loved ones. But, because it, it happens, it gets normalized. So when something becomes normalized, then it doesn't catch our attention. It doesn't consume our attention so much. So basically, in the world, there is distress at some level or the other constantly. But when that, when some distress or some danger is not normalized. It is, it is abnormal. That's when it, it screams and demands our attention. It surges up in our consciousness and catches our attention. So that's one, one way. It's already caught our attention. So if you could discuss, if you talk, look at my talk, it was the coronavirus was one example I used to talk about the broad principles of philosophy that can help us to make sense of things. So if uh, road accidents were a major concern, then that topic could have been used. It's, the principle here is that there are timeless truths. But the more timeless a truth, the, more less, the less time people have for it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sometime in the future. But it's only when the timeless seems timely that we want to hear it. The whole principle in spiritual knowledge, you see, Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita does not necessarily speak something which is strikingly new to Arjuna. Of course, he integrates things together in a particular way and presents them in a way that is relevant to Arjuna. But that philosophy becomes urgent and relevant for him because at that time he has to decide should I fight or should I not fight? So it's a principle in the tradition itself that the timeless has to be presented in timeliness. So there are so the deaths which have become normalized, they don't they don't consume our attention much. But when the death has not become it's abnormal. That alarms us. And to some extent, we as human beings are also affected by the situations around us. So the idea is, for most people, Krishna, okay, this is the world and this is Krishna. So now, why should I stop looking at the world and start looking at Krishna? Some people might do that because they are already spiritually inclined. But the whole principle of the Bhagavad Gita is that, yes, we need to learn to see not just God beyond the world, but see God in the world. So we see spiritual truths not just as transcending the world, but spiritual truths as manifesting in the world. So that's how we use this coronavirus as a, as a launching pad for discussing about timeless truths that can equip us in all situ all times, including the time of the coronavirus. Does that address your question? As far as the hyper extra attention, yeah, that's human attention, what it will go towards, it's very, very difficult to see. A few, I think maybe a year or two ago, there was a cricketer, who Australian cricketer who died in a, not a road accident, in a bouncer hit him. 
and he hit him on his neck or something and he died because of that. So now if you consider in football, at least in American football, it's far, far more brutal. People get, they just hammer into each other and they get brain injuries. And there are so many casualties that happen in cars and this and that. So it's sometimes what will what will catch people's attention that can vary from person situation to situation. So now if we understand these principles, even with respect to road accidents, you now we can make more sense of road accidents. We can learn to drive more responsibly. And these principles can equip us for all situations. Okay. Thank you. Yes, one. Um, Prabhuji, you spoke about um, God's will, free will, and evil. Yeah. But how about situations where um, uh, somebody is like, you know, um, uh, like uh, take a cat, you know, if you corner it, it will try and attack back. So in that case, is it is is it? It's not cat's free will that you know it's trying to attack us, and it's not evil either. But because we are trying to corner it, it is trying to attack us. So where do we see this kind of situation? Okay, so if we try to corner a cat and it tries to attack us back, so when does this fall within this three framework, God's will, free will and evil? <clears throat> See, we have to understand that there are certain things which are more or less, uh, we could say programmed in nature. So if I step off a 10 story building and I fall down, well, is it God's will? Well, you could say ultimately everything is God's will. But it's it's our misuse of free will. And there's a reaction to that misuse of free will. So we may forget gravity, but gravity will not forget us. <laughs> <laughs> so then we to that. So we, when we are, broadly speaking, we understand that animals are a part of the natural world. Although animals also have free will, they are souls like us, they also have free will. But their free will is largely very limited. It is, say a cow is eating grass, it finishes is eating grass in one row, it has the free will whether I should eat grass on the left side or the right side. But it doesn't have much free will beyond that. Say when a cat sees a mouse, the cat can't think, oh, today is Ekadashi. <laughs> <laughs> so, today is a sacred day, I'm going to fast. No, if it's hungry, it pounce on it. So, for practical purposes, we can say that when we, we say, misuse our free will to, to as you say, corner some elements, corner some beings in nature, when they react to us, that's, that's, a reaction to our own misuse of freedom. So now some people might be out to hunt because it's just a profession. Some people might be sadistic when they get joy in hurting others. If it's a joy in hurting others, then it's evil. <coughs> so any framework, this is a broad principle, that every framework for analysis is like a map. The map, on a, on a map, you can say we can have very neat Division, say if you consider India is here, Pakistan is here, China is here. But if you actually go to the border, there is no one thin, one clear demarcating line everywhere. So, a map is useful to get a broad sense of the territory. But the territory is always much more complex than the map. Similarly, any analytical frame that we use, it is like a map. It gives us some sense of the territory, some sense of the reality. But the reality is always more complex than the, than the analytical framework that we use to analyze it. So we use this as like a map, not an exhaustive description, uh, but an indicative guide. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, after this coronavirus emerged, there are many mass worships that are happening. People gather in temples, Ignas and Homas are happening. Uh, should people even do that? Would there be any positive effect because of this? If it is any, if, if at all there is any effect, what's the explanation uh, behind that? Okay. So, when this, this coronavirus is coming, so people are doing yakyas and homas, and 
<coughs> will it have any effect? Okay. There are certain practices which I talk about the immediate cause, the remote cause and the ultimate cause. So now, <coughs> there are certain practices given in certain traditions which can address the remote cause. Mm -hmm. So, if there is, uh, if those practices are done, then they can have a positive effect. Now, how does it exactly happen? Again, there are multiple levels of explanations for this. I have a friend in IIT Mumbai who did his PhD study, PhD on the on the environmental benefits of fire sacrifices. So if now, for example, uh, in the Rig Veda, it is said that there is uh, a particular sacrifice that will lead to rainfall. If you set up that yagna, now if today's rational mind might dismiss it. What? How can a fire over here cause rains? But what he found is that if you if you take the specific elements that are mentioned in the Rig Veda, the specific kind of wood, the specific kind of ghee, the specific proportion of the fire of the sacrificial altar, then by that burning, the smoke that is created, the smoke contains chemicals that can cause cloud seeding. The cloud seeding is the phenomena where there are clouds in the sky. But the clouds are just not giving rains. So then, some, now when we call it the artificial rains, sometimes scientists try to induce that. What they do is they send helicopters into the clouds and they try to put in chemicals over there, which will cause the clouds to precipitate new rains. That's cloud seeding. So that's what we are doing: cloud seeding by sophisticated means. That the the yagya seems to have a similar effect. So now, there, there is much scope for scientific research in this area, but so his thesis is that many of these yagyas at one level will cleanse the environment. So if, if the yagyas are done with the specific ingredients mentioned in the, Rig Veda, in the Vedas, then they can cleanse the environment. So this is something which we can understand at our rational level. So the universe is uh, much more complicated than what we perceive. So modern science has one way of perceiving the universe. And it is powerful. But it, it may not be the only way to perceive the universe. So th there could be the scientific and the spiritual ways need not be contradictory, they can be complementary. I'll give you a couple of examples to illustrate this. Suppose there's a billiards board and then somebody has a camera right on top of the billiards board and then they observe what is happening through the camera and they see okay this ball starts moving and this ball moves and that hits that ball and that hit ball hits that ball and then that ball goes into hole. and this whole event of starting from this ball's motion to that ball's going into the hole this whole event can be explained in terms of the laws of physics it came at this momentum, this speed, this angle, and that's why that ball went into the hole. Now that is a that is a correct explanation. Simultaneously, if we expanded the camera further, we could see that that ball was hit by an expert player with a stick. So why did the ball go into the hole? Was it by the laws of physics? Was it by the expertise of this player? Well, both explanations are valid. They are complementary, they are not contradictory. So, there, there can be a mechanical explanation for events and there can be a personal explanation for events. And both can work together. So, of course, reality is much more complex and this is just one framework I give, one, one example I give to illustrate this point. But the principle is that, that science looks at the universe like the camera is focused only on the on the billiards board. Science, right from its beginning, if you look at the history of science, we start with Francis Bacon and other pioneers of science. 
they divided reality into what they called as primary properties and secondary properties. Prime, according, to the sci, according to the scientific method, the primary properties are those which are measurable. Say, length, breadth, viscosity, density, luminosity. Those parameters which are measurable, they are called as primary properties. And secondary properties are those which are not measurable. So taste, beauty, kindness, love, these are non-measurable. So, science focused on the primary parameters and tried to come up with mathematical formulations which could explain the correlation between various primary parameters. And it has been extraordinarily successful in that. At the same time, what has happened when attention focuses on one thing, it goes off the other things. So, now, the scientific way of looking at the world is powerful. And it is, it is important. It is important to look at it that way and learn from it. But that needn't be the only way we look at things. So, if we look at our own day-to-day -day experiences, we are not primarily interested in the primary properties. Say, if you go home and say, you know, if say you, you go to a, go to some place and you meet a, some person, and you go home and say, you know, I met a very interesting person. Oh, really? Tell me more, he says. That person 150 pounds and 5 feet. <laughs> really? Is that the most, if some person has some extraordinary dimensions, we might be interested in that. But when we look at people, the primary parameters are not their physical dimensions. It's, it's their qualities, their, their interests, their personality, so many things. So we, for the world of science, or what science considers the primary properties, are not the primary properties in our world of daily living. So, 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 to explain this in a little more philosophy, just to give one philosophical term for this, is the term called cognitive dualism. Cognitive dualism means two realities. So, cognitive dualism means, cognitive is the process of perception, cognition. Cognitive dualism means the same reality can be perceived in two different ways. Say, if you have a beautiful painting, now you could just look at it and see what is it that is depicted through the painting. It could be some stirring image of some heroic act done by some person. But you look at it from another way and you could just see that as a combination of various colors. And that is also a valid way of looking at it. But if I look at it only as a combination of colors, I will see the, the image that has been depicted to it. So basically, reality is multi-level. And we can have cognitive dualism. So science looks at the things from one way and the spiritual vision looks at another way. It's like if you look at a computer and we show a computer a painting, you know, with, with Google access of the computer might recognize the painting. But the computer won't experience anything. It might be a dazzling, inspiring painting, but the computer not going to feel like experience any inspiration. So there is a mechanical way of looking at it, there is a personal way of looking at things. So now these two, at some areas, they interface. But the two are also distinct ways of looking at things. Now, all this is not to say that any or every ritual that is done is valid. And we have to look at what practices are being done, on what basis they are being done, how well they are being done, and what effects are they having. So we don't critically, uncritically accept anything that is done as beneficial. But we don't... Uh, we don't uh, skeptically or cynically reject everything as mere superstition. We understand that the reality is more complex and there are practices which might tap aspects of reality which the scientific method does not tap. So the principle here is that there are, why I was talking about these two levels of perception, that within another level of perception, there are higher realities, there are higher beings. There is the supreme being God, there are devatas, and when certain yajnas are performed, these satisfy those higher beings. And when the higher beings are satisfied, then they can unleash cosmic powers by which certain disasters can be averted in ways that we humans can't do. So that is the purpose, how, how authentic and how effective a particular practice is that has to be evaluated on a case-to-case -case basis. Okay, thank you.
Neil, he'll stop here. Okay. Are you making an announcement or a question? Uh, question. Put the microphone down. Um, okay. Prabhuji, in your lecture you explained about suitcases, um, and you're only carrying one suitcase, and just uh, taking it one step at a time, sort of thing. So sometimes in life, you know, uh, you know if you there's too many suitcases that get put on you, you know, you, you can't carry them and you feel overburdened. But sometimes, all those suitcases come at once. So you can't select and only choose to pick up one. All of that, all of the calamities come at once. How do we understand the situation and how do we get through those sorts of situations? So if multiple calamities come at the same time, so we may not want to pick up many suitcases, but many suitcases are piled on top of us. So what do we do at that time? At that time also, it's important that we, we divide our working frame into small units. So amid, un, amid unmanageably difficult times, we need to reduce our working frame to manageable units of time. Okay, I have these 10 big issues to deal with. The next one hour, what can I do? Let me deal with this one issue fully, give my attention as best as I can, and then move on to the next issue. It might be one hour, it may be half an hour. See, life can overwhelm us, but we need to know that the future can't hurt us in the present. The future may be dangerous, but the future can't hurt us in the present. So actually, all that we have to deal with is the present. You see, the present is going to lead to the future. So I have to deal with the future also. Yes, but the way to deal with the future is by dealing with the present. So what that means is that we can use our intelligence at times to decide, okay, I have to deal with all these issues. This is the most urgent. This is the most important. We focus on this. But then we deal with things one at a time. And if we understand that we are souls and we are parts of God, then we can actually discover that we are stronger than what we think we are. At one level, difficulties may help us, may make us realize that we are, we are, we are not as tough as we thought. That's true. Alone, we are, not, we are never tough enough to deal with all of life's problems. Sometimes we might be, but sooner or later they become too much. But with God, we can deal even with problems far bigger than what we thought we could. And the way to stay connected with God is through a service attitude. Okay. In this situation, my Lord, how can I deal with this situation? One thing at a time. One thing at a time. Do it. See, we live in the present. I have all seminar on this topic. We live in the present, but we don't live for the present. We live for something bigger than the present. That's we live for God. Suppose somebody is sick and is in terrible pain, and we tell them to live in the present. <laughs> <laughs> the present is miserable. No, so they have, to, they have to live in the present, but they have to live for something bigger than the present. So we understand that Krishna is the ultimate reality, and we are serving Him, and the way we serve Him is in the present, in the present. So if we try to maintain that service attitude, gradually, one, one, one thing we deal with it, and we'll find that we, we, Tougher than what faces, bigger than what faces us, is what graces us. What faces us may be very big, but if we take shelter of God, and bigger than what faces us, is what graces us. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.